Today I'm going to show you how to create this stylized tune shader with line art. It's a fairly new style for me, so I spent the last week and a half putting together five scenes to practice before recording a tutorial. I'm going to show you an overview of my choices when building these scenes, but if you want to spe see specifically how I've built these scenes, I've made them available on my Patreon. And thanks very much to my current patrons and government supporters. Your support really means a lot. This general setup is largely based on Simon Klins's tune shader setup that he has on his art station. I've really only changed a few things, so go check out his art station for a few variations that you can try too. I'll put the link in the description. And this is what our note setup is going to look like. This simple scene that I'm going to make during the tutorial, I'll also make this available for free on my Gumroad if you want to just open this up and see very simply how I set up the basic shader and line art style. To start off, I'm going to quickly build something here. Um, I'm just going to move my cube just off center in edit mode and bring in a mirror modifier. Just click Y as well. Then I'm just going to, yeah, like I said, just build something really quickly here. Just drop this down, maybe inset it, bring it up, extrude, size up a little bit, move it up. Just something like that, that's fine. And maybe I'll do one more thing here. Just do a little bevel here. And extrude it inwards. There we go. So uh, the reason I did this is it's going to be much easier to see how our texture works if we've got objects that are going to have shadows. If we just hit left a cube in the middle, it'd be really hard to kind of see how our object is interacting with the light. I'm just going to move my timeline up a little bit here and I'll change this to the shader editor. Then we can have kind of a big area for our 3D viewport here while we're working with the shader editor. We can easily move it up and down. I'm going to hit N and get rid of that shelf on the right. I'm going to start by building that halftone shader that I made in the last tutorial. I actually called it procedural pointillism, but it should be a halftone shader. That's a great name for it. And this is going to be the third setup. So I'm going to do this fairly quickly. But if you're interested in how it works, check out that tutorial. I've got a much more in-depth explanation. So I'm going to bring in a texture coordinate node. And we're going to come out of the window for now. And I'll explain what that does in a minute here. I'm going to bring in a mapping node. I'll just change these to something higher. Let's change them both to 300 for now. If you want to see what this looks like as you're working, just make sure to hold down Z, move your mouse up to go into rendered mode. It won't look like much yet, but uh, as it starts to form, you'll see more stuff picking up there. So I'm going to bring in a separate XYZ, place it here, and bring in a math node. Place that after the X there, then duplicate it twice. I'm going to change the first one to 2 and leave it on add. Second one's going to be multiply, and I'll leave it on 0.5. And the third one is going to be round. So, uh, yeah, basically we're adding 2 to all the x values, multiplying it by 0.5, so halving it, and then rounding it to the nearest whole number. Then I'm going to mul or duplicate this add here and put it on the end. And we're going to feed y into that bottom one there. Then I'll bring in a combine x, y, z, and place it right here. And this is actually going to feed into the y. And the original x going to feed into the X. You can plug the Z into the Z if you want. It actually doesn't do anything, but uh, might help you feel like things are a little bit more organized if you do that. So if you look at this X and Z, I guess, you know, we're not really going to use that, but X is remaining unchanged. So we're only remapping the Y values and it depends on what the X value is as well. And like I said, there's more of an explanation in the other video if you want to check it out. I'm going to duplicate this separate X, Y, Z, place it here, and I'll just bring it back here to organize it a little bit better. I'll just move these around. That's uh, shift and right click and drag through those uh, node noodles to add some reroute points. I'm going to grab this add from up here and just put it on the X there. Then I will duplicate it four times so we have five nodes in a row. This first one we'll leave on add. I'm going to set that to one. The second one we'll set to absolute, which you just get by opening that up and hitting B. The third one is going to be set to modulo, so I'll just find that over here, modulo, and we'll leave it on 2. The fourth one is going to be set to subtract, so just hit S while that's open, and we'll set this to 1. And then the last one we'll set to absolute again, which is just B. I'm going to duplicate all five of these math nodes with Shift D, and then I'm going to plug Y into the bottom one there. I'm going to duplicate this combine X, Y, Z, place it right here. X is going to go into the top one. I guess the top one is going to go into X. That makes more sense to say. And the bottom one is going to go into Y. We've now created a remapped coordinate system. And if I put on the last step here, which is a gradient texture, 
and set it to spherical, we can see we've created a whole bunch of really tiny dots. Actually, we can't really see that because they're too small. Let's make this value a little larger, maybe 30. So um, now we can see if we rotate around, we can see those same dots no matter where we are. And uh, it's because we have it set on window. If you had it set on object, it would always be stationary. But, but because we have it set on window, it's going to be moving around each time. And I'm going to set the x value to something a little higher so that the dots are a little bit more round. You can play around with these values here if you want. You can set this much higher if you want, okay, 200. Now they'll be more vertically oriented, but um, you know whatever you want. Uh, this is going to be controlling the size and the dimensions of those dots. I'm going to set the x to 300 and the y to 100. There we go. Next up, I'm going to bring in a color ramp and I'll just place it right after this gradient here. I'm going to change it to constant and I'm going to duplicate it twice. I'll just put it right there and right there. I'm just going to leave those where they are for now. On this first color ramp that I set up, I'm going to bring the gradient down to 0.5. I've got it set on constant, so that means there's no fall off. If you wanted a little bit of a fall off, you could do ease and then just do something like this here. It's kind of similar, but there's just going to be um, you can't really see it. Let's turn these down a little bit. So we'll go back to like 30 and 10. So if we bring it down like this, you can see there's a little bit of a fall off there. But if we have it on constant, there's absolutely no fall off. So it's up to you how you're going to do that. I'm going to set it at 0.5 with the constant. And uh, why don't we leave it on 30 and 10 just so we can see it better for now. And I'll turn it up again when we're done. I'm going to grab this principled BSDF, just drag it up above this color ramp. And I'm going to feed a normal map into it. It doesn't make a huge difference, this step I'm doing for our outcome. I'll show you what it is later, uh, but Simon did have it in his setup, so I figured I might as well use it for now. And I'm going to set the strength at 0.14. The lower you have the strength, the less of an effect this has on the outcome as well. Let's quickly touch on what this normal map is doing right here. Uh, basically, if you change this color, it's going to change the shadows slightly. So let's zoom in on that. It's very subtle if this is turned down. I'm just going to go back, uh, control Z. So let's turn it up a little bit. Let's turn it up to like maybe 0.5. And then let's move this around and see if it makes any difference. Yeah, still no difference. Uh, it's going to make it more of a difference if there's more shapes and contours there. But let's try to turn this up to 20. Yeah, there we go. See, it's making a difference now. We can see right here, if we change this color, it's just going to change where those shadows occur. So there's just one more setting that you can play around with as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't really need to be there, but um, you know you can put it there if you want. It's really your choice. It's going to revert back to the original settings there. Now we're going to use a node that's only available in Eevee, and it's pretty much the magic of how these tune shaders work, and that is the shader to RGB. So let me just show you. If you tried to plug this principal BSDF into this color ramp, it's going to give you this red line, which is an error. And that doesn't work because once it's been converted to a shader, you can't bring it back to color. And so we can, if we use this node right here, if I put it here, now we have no issues. And take a look at this other color ramp that we just plugged into. So I'm just going to take a look at the output there. And I'm going to drag this slider down and add a new slider as well. So we'll have three sliders in total. This first one's going to be at zero. The second one's going to be at 0.3 or pretty close. And the third one is going to be at 0.59 or pretty close. So here is where you make some creative decisions and you choose a quick little color palette for yourself. So I try not to use too many different colors. Basically, I've got a blue here, a blue here, and a green in the middle. So I'm going to set that up. The first one is going to be hex code 171F36, so kind of a dark blue. The second one is going to be hex code 204D22. And the third one is going to be hex code 8EAFBF. At this point, if you're following along, you should try moving this light around because it's basically how we control those colors on our objects. Move this around and the shadows uh, depend on this gradient. You know, where the most light is, we're going to get this light blue, this middle green in, you know, middle shadow area. And then in our deep shadows, we're going to get that dark blue. So it's very cool, that effect. Already we have something that looks kind of like a tune shader. Looks pretty cool. Next, I want to incorporate those halftone dots that I made down here. So let's turn these down a little bit or make them smaller, I guess. So I'm going to go 300 and 100. 
and I'm going to bring in a mix shader. Oh, not a mix RGB. A mix shader there. And I'll place it right here. And this color ramp that is forming the dots is going to go into slot one. No, sorry, into the uh, factor. This color ramp that we just created up here is going to go into slot one. And I'll just make some reroutes, make that easier to see. And I'm going to bring in one more principled BSDF here. I'm going to leave it completely normal, except I'm just going to change it to black. And I'm going to plug this into slot two. If you look at this outcome here, we can see we've got the dots now, but they are appearing everywhere. So to fix that, I'm just going to use this other color ramp here and make another mix shader, place it right afterwards. And this color ramp here, I'm just going to leave it on constant bring this white way down. It's kind of going a little slow for me for a second there. Loading in the textures. Bring this white way down and bring the black up a little bit so the white is on the bottom. I'm going to feed this output of the color ramp into the factor on that mix shader we just made. And I'm going to feed this other color for color ramp. It's actually going to go into slot one of that mix shader. And this mix shader is going to go into the bottom there. So now we've got this controller that basically shows where we've got those dots and where we don't. Uh, the setup I have has it only in the shadows and not in those light areas. I'm gonna move this around, it doesn't matter too much. I had it set at like 0.1, but uh, fool around with that and just see what you can come up with. The last step we're gonna do here is just make this a little bit lighter, uh, those dots especially, because uh, I don't want them quite black. So I'm gonna bring in another mix shader here and just bring in an emission shader. and place it right here and this color I'm going to set to 81AABF, so kind of a lighter blue, kind of similar to this blue right here. And I'm going to plug it into the bottom slot here. It currently has too much influence, so I'm just going to put this to 0.1. And now we've got the closer, this is basically what I had for my setup. You can move this around if you want, do any number of things. This is just going to change the slight washed out look, so it doesn't look quite so dark. But, um, you know, it's totally up to you how you have that set up. Now I'm going to add some line art. And to do that, I'm going to hit Shift A and go down to Grease Pencil. And you can use several of these. I think Stroke is the easiest one to do because you have to set up a little bit, but you don't have to set up that much. So I'm going to bring in a Stroke, go into Edit Mode, just make sure we hit A to select everything, and just delete all of these points. So basically, it's like an empty. I'm going to go over to the Stroke here, make sure it's selected on my uh, Inspector, whatever this is, Outliner and then go down to the modifiers. And we have a completely different set of mo uh, modifiers for this grease pencil. I'm gonna choose line art. We can choose to do it in a collection or an object. Because I just have one object, I'm gonna do a, an object, but I could do a collection very easily. That's also very useful. So let's select object, and I'm just gonna use my picker tool to select that cube there. And then for layer, I'm gonna select lines. And for material, I'm gonna set, set it to uh, black. And now basically wherever the camera is, we're going to have those line art uh, pieces uh, showing through. There we go. So if I make the whole scene visible here, um, we can see that line art now. And so if you orbit around, you can see there's no line art on the back side. That's okay. Uh, basically just bring the camera around there if you want to see line art on any of those faces. There's a lot of settings you can go through here. I'm going to click back on that stroke, go back to the modifiers. And so one thing you can do is edge types. If you just want the outlines, basically just select contours. And now it'll just be the outlines. If you want more pieces, um, you know, add more here. This crease as well is going to add those extra lines there. Basically at this angle, um, you know, that's where it adds it. If you turn it up all the way, it's going to add every single face. I wouldn't recommend that. It doesn't look very good. But um, material borders is nice. Like if you wanted to make a different material in one of these faces, for instance, like this here, let's just say this is material two and I'll just make it slightly different color here. I guess I didn't assign it. There we go. So now it doesn't really look different, but it is a different material. Let's make it look different with this shadow color as well. There we go. So now we've got a little border around that as well. The edge marks is also very useful. You can hover over these, by the way, and it gives you a little uh, description. So it generates strokes from freestyle marked edges. So if I go into any of these objects here, let's say I want this edge right here to be marked. If 
for whatever reason. I'll just grab the whole edge, and I'm just going to hit Control E and go down to the bottom, mark freestyle edge. So if it turns green in edit mode, that means you did it correctly. If you tab out, it should show up now as another stroke. Let's look at one more useful setting uh, before we move on. So this material border edge marks, uh, let's look at intersections. So this one here, if you hover over, generates strokes from intersections. So for this, I'm gonna create another cube and I'll just move it over here for a second. And I'm going to put just one of these materials I've created onto there. And I'm going to move it right in here. So um, it's already showing up as a stroke right here. Basically, the intersection between these two objects. One thing I did off camera is I changed the source type to collection instead of object. So now I'm just using my main collection as the, the stroke collection. So everything in my scene, really, because it's all in the same collection, is having that stroke uh, applied to it. Another thing that's very useful with this stroke modifier here is the style. And that's just the line width. So I like to turn it down to 10 for a lot of my scenes. Um, somewhere between 10 and 20 is where I've had it for most of my scenes. And sometimes I'll have some lines thicker and some lines thinner. And you can do that just with, you know, setting it, you know, making a several different strokes, setting them to different objects or different collections in your scene. Another thing you could do is add another modifier. You know, for instance, the opacity modifier is kind of interesting. It's got this influence custom curve you can set up here. So if I bring this down, you can see it's basically um, more opaque in some areas, less opaque in other areas. Play around with this curve. You can kind of see what it does. You know, this is going to make the left side, I believe, you know, less opaque. I don't know. Just play around with it. It is a pretty cool modifier to get some more stylistic choices to your lines there. I'm going to pop that off. You could also do the thickness, um, that's kind of interesting. Again, we could just use a custom curve and play around with this. Um, I don't know if it's doing a huge amount here. Yeah, there we go. So now you have different uh, widths of thickness depending on um, the orientation of your model there. So I'm going to click that off. And one other interesting I found, one other interesting modifier I found is this noise one. So you can just do the position. That'll increase the noise there. And you can see it just kind of brings some of those lines away from the faces that they're supposed to be outlining. Uh, it's pretty neat. And again, you can use this custom curve to influence it, this randomized thing, um, you know, a bunch of different things. If you press play as well, it'll kind of bounce those lines around. Let's talk about lighting. So, so far I've only got this one point light here. I find maybe one or two point lights is probably good and make sure there's a reason for it. Don't just put them around wherever. Make sure there's a light in your scene or something like that. I wouldn't go crazy with these though. I find it's better to have less than more. And one other thing you could consider putting in here is maybe a sun. You know, if you want to have some overarching angle there, maybe you have some moonlight or some sunlight or whatever coming from one direction, you can set that up and it'll create an interesting effect there as well. You can also choose to change the color of the background of the world, the world by coming to the world properties here. So let's say you wanna make it completely dark. Um, if you do that, definitely bring in a sun because it's gonna look kind of weird, but again, just another option for you uh, for the lighting there. It uh, doesn't have to be too complicated. I find something simple works better and uh, just try not to overdo it for modeling choices. I love this tile because you can really just create super simple models and they can look really good so long as you have the broad strokes more or less right. So, um, you know, let's bring in a simple cube here and, uh, you know, extrude with E, size, um, inset is very useful here as well. Also, if you want to do like a multiple face inset where you don't all want them to be like you could do it this way here or you could hit I I and have each face inset uh, by themselves extrude them down if you want you know all these things work pretty well it's also helpful to know how to change you know let's say you wanted to um, change the size due to the median point so you've got all these faces selected hit s they all move inwards but let's say you selected individual origins then you hit s now they're all going to size in uh, to their own individual origins, which is very useful. 
also good to make small imperfections. So let's say you had these pillars, you could apply this material and then maybe go around to one of them. And let's just put a loop cut in there, hit control B to bevel it. And actually I'll put one more bevel in the middle. And then I'm gonna grab this and just put it in a little. Actually, I won't do it like that. Let's make it so that there's loop cuts here and here. And then this will be just a little dent here. So just like that. Small imperfections like that really do go a long way. I would make it a little bit better though. I don't think that looks very good. These square shapes here, I didn't really spend a lot of time on it. So I'll still set to individual origins. So back to medium point, something like that does not look very good, but you could make it look good pretty quickly. Yeah, that's not bad. I break my modeling knowledge into three categories. The first category is ways to select and deselect faces quickly. So things like local select, control plus or minus, select similar, select loops, uh, that kind of thing. The second group is ways to make broad sweeping changes. So things like proportional editing, global versus local transformations, mirror and array modifiers, etc. And the third way is ways to clean up all the shit you fucked up by doing those broad sweeping changes, which inevitably happens. So things like uh, J versus F to create new edges or faces, snapping to vertex or increment, origin points and 3D cursors and the relationship between them, and merge by distance, etc. I've now got my scene open, and you can see I've got these two lights here um, from where I had that Coca-Cola sign, and these lights up here, and then this light up here, and I've also got a sun somewhere around here. Uh, yeah, right here, just pointing in. And then this is the material we created right here. Um, for some reason, I've got it called Warehouse Blue Pipe. Not sure why. I guess I never renamed it. And this Coca-Cola sign, yeah, basically I've got the logo and it's just plugged into this top principled BSDF. That's all I did. And I just UV unwrapped it so that it uh, fit well for me. Same with the Lotto sign. The way I got this slight, uneven, imperfect look here is basically by going in, making some loop cuts, grabbing some of these vertices in, you know, uh, what's it called, wireframe mode, and then grabbing those and moving them gently along the x-axis. Not anything as much as that, but just slight little bits of movement help give it a more realistic feel. For this snow, basically I grabbed the top face of a bunch of the models, like the top of this little mailbox, the top of this stuff here, uh, the top of this lamppost and garbage, top of the sidewalk, and the street and I duplicated all of those faces and just separated them by parent or separated them by, um, what's it called? Like uh, you grab everything. Okay, I'm not grabbing the right thing. So here's the sidewalk here. Let's say I grab this face here. I'll just show you. So I'm gonna duplicate it, right click it so it remains in the same spot and then just hit P, separate by selection. That's what I was trying to say. So you separate it by selection. Then you've got all those sidewalk pieces. I'm gonna delete that because I don't wanna do that again. And I group them or join them all together to make it one big plane, which is this plane now. And I just basically added a subdivision surface modifier, a solidify modifier, and a displace modifier. And so that's how we get this interesting little bumpiness just from this displace modifier. You can see I've got the strength turned down to 0.1. And for the noise, the size is really small, 0.0001. And, uh, you know, that's really it. I just did that really quickly and got this interesting snow set up here. Some of these I even chose to leave untextured, like all the snow. I actually didn't put a texture on that. If you see, it's just blank. Um, same with the windows. I didn't really worry about that. I actually, I did add a principled BSDF, but I just didn't change any texture. I thought it provided a nice contrast. I don't like to have things too busy. I like to have spots where your eyes can rest a little bit before they move on to the rest of the scene. So that's what I was trying to accomplish with that. Let's look at this kitchen sink scene I've got here. And let's check out this glass because this is a different kind of material. You know, if you have EV and you try and make something like this without changing some of the settings, it's not quite gonna work. So the first thing I did is just come up to render settings and just check screen space reflections. Uh, it just makes it a little bit better looking when you've got some reflections going on and then come down to the material properties and under blend mode you have to make sure this is set to alpha hashed instead of uh, whatever it is opaque as a default 
if you look at that material, it's the same thing. You know, I've got my half tone shader here, I've got the same setup here. These are my three colors for the palette. Here's my emission highlight there. Same thing with the 0.1 uh, shader there. This is the new part here. So I've just got a layer weight facing output going into a color ramp with nothing changed, uh, but I could adjust it if I want. The mix shader is coming here and it's just going into a trans, or pardon me, this transparent uh, is going into the other slot on that mix shader. So basically if I were to switch these around, it would be you know transparency on the outside and opaqueness on the inside. Just gotta give it a second to load in here. Yeah, there we go. So that's the reason I had them switch like that. Uh, it's just a little bit better. And another thing, if I don't have a Catmull Clark, or pardon me, a subdivision surface modifier on there, you can see you can see the individual faces a little bit better. So if you don't want that, just make sure to turn that on. And that liquid inside, by the way, I did that just by bringing down the color ramp a little bit on the uh, Fresnel, or pardon me, this uh, layer weight output basically making it a little bit more opaque, but still slightly see-through. Same with this uh, dish soap over here. For this food here, uh, basically it's you know the same kind of shader going on there, nothing's different there. But again, I've got a subdivision surface and a displacement modifier turned on there. And I basically just dropped it into the pan a little bit so that only parts of it are sticking through. This is another scene I made with a barge in the background. And you can see I've got a little particle system here Zoom in on this rock, actually, get a better view. And you can see most of these blades of grass are actually underneath the ground. I just got the tips uh, poking through. I thought it looked kind of cool there. And then I've got these particle systems on these uh, areas down here as well. I've just turned them off because they kind of slowed down my computer. But it's just these two sizes of rocks there. Same thing with right here, uh, just a lot less rocks. Again, same kind of thing as before as well. These are just, you know, planes with a little bit of geometry added and subdivision surface and a displacement modifier put on there. I've got my particles off to the side over here and they're still being outlined in the picture because I've got them all in this overall main scene collection. Let's look at the stroke I've got set up just so you can see what that looks like. I've got it set to collection as source type and then collection as main scene. So it's going to outline everything in that main scene. It's just set on lines in black, and all of these are set as the default. The only thing I changed is the thickness to 10. One last thing in the settings you can consider doing is under the render settings, coming down to color management, I've already changed this from filmic to standard. So it gives it a bit of a narrower range. You can see it's just a little bit more highs and lows here. If I change it to standard, it's a little bit crushed. Uh, it looks a little bit more like a comic book style with this. It's a very subtle thing, but it's just something you can do aside from compositing to change the uh, color scheme here. So that's it for today. Let me know if you have any questions about what I was doing here. Uh, see what I can do to clear up any confusion. Thanks a lot for watching.